Good evening and welcome to our program, Caregiver Mental Health Playbook, Caring for the Caregiver. We are very grateful to have Dr. Aranesh Mishra with us this evening. Dr. Mishra is the Chair of Behavioral Health, Hackensack Meridian Health Central Region and the Department of Psychiatry at Raritan Bay Medical Center, Perth Amboy. He is a Distinguished Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association as is and is board certified in psychiatry as well as geriatric psychiatry. So I want to welcome you, Dr. Mishra, and thank you for speaking with us this evening. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. And um, welcome, everybody, and good evening. Um, I'm Dr. Mishra. I'm here at Raritan Bay. I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, as Gina just mentioned. And uh, today we are going to talk about this very important topic, uh, which is caregiving. Just so that you know that I'm not going to read out all the slides. Uh, the information is right there. We will pick up the highlights from every slide and discuss a little bit about uh, the important aspects of uh, mentioned there. That is one thing. And second thing is um, that I talk about caregiving to medical students and residents a lot. Being a geriatric psychiatrist, it's a common concern of uh, my specialty. And I see how big is the problem in the community. So let's uh, start. Uh, that what will be in today's discussion? We basically, we'll be discussing that what is the impact on the caregiver? What, what happens when you take a primary caregiving role? Uh, because it comes with health healthcare risk, uh, there's a lot of stress and burnout involved if proper care is not taken uh, while being a primary, primary caregiver. And how can we cope with the stress and um, how to avoid burnout, and we'll discuss this term further uh, as we go along. So basically, by the end of this talk, you should have information about that. What are the problems associated with uh, caregiving, which is sometimes role which is thrust upon ourselves, um, whether you want it or not, but you have to do it. And I find this uh, this kind of mock um, advertisement for a caregiver, but it's pretty apt. So if you look at, uh, let's read a few points there. Caregiver wanted. The person must be willing to work long hours without pay. This is exactly the case. The caregivers, they're working for their loved ones. They, they're helping their loved ones. But it is a long hours job and there's really no pay involved. And then you can read on so many things written there. You know, there's no vacation, no days off. You have to relocate whether you like it or not. There's meaning whether you had training or not, not, it does not matter. You get on the job training, so on and so forth. Um, so it is, it is something which we do it uh, because it is, uh, it is required uh, for one of our loved ones. But many a times in my clinical practice, I see that people are not really prepared uh, either technically in the caregiving role about how to help themselves while they are helping others, you know, and there's really no respite for them uh, many a times. So one should remember that uh, caregivers are tireless volunteers, you know, which uh, continue to work 24 seven. And if you see the bottom line there on this slide, Approximately 40 million people in the United States uh, today are providing 37 billion billion hours of care per year. So it is a very high burden on our society. Let's talk about a few facts. Um, who are these caregivers? They're all around us, actually. If you look at a quarter of American people, you know, uh, who are 25 years or older, primary caregiver. And out of those, generally speaking, when we talk about caregivers and me being geriatric psychiatrist, you know, always I thought that caregivers are for people uh, high up in the age, you know, elderly people uh, taking care of their spouses. But no, approximately half of them are between 18 and 49 years of age. Think about these people have a different role to play in this age group. They're not retired. They have different job responsibilities, but they also are in primary caregiver roles. And 
uh, this is a fact that this responsibility primarily falls in the uh, on the female gender in our society. Seventy five percent of the um, caregivers, primary caregivers, are female. As we discussed, that about uh, more than a half of them have full or part time jobs. Uh, so this is almost a second job for them. So if you look at an, on an average, eighteen hours per week are spent in providing care. It becomes almost like a half-time job. In addition to, remember, people are doing one, two jobs uh, to make their ends meet. And add on top this another half-time job, how stressful it can be. On top of that, more than one-third of them, two-thirds of them, approximately two-thirds of them have to spend their own money to provide care. And they start feeling the financial strain related with this. And no wonder, the last line you see there on this slide is that it makes more than half of them feel overwhelmed by caregiving role. So this is what the status of caregiving, who are the people who are providing this care and what are the stakes for them and consequences for them, both physical and um, economical. Now, as we saw that uh, providing care can be overwhelming. Uh, these are certain things which people have to do for their loved ones when they're in primary caregiver role. And if you see from left to right, you know that shopping is the most common activity uh, people do for their uh, loved ones, 84%. And if you move along medical appointments, managing finances for the loved ones, transport transporting them to appointments, doing groceries and whatnot, that's another and about um, two thirds of them um, spend time in communicating with relatives and friends uh, what, what is the condition of the person they're taking care of. That makes this job 24-7, 365, without any respite, uh, that kind of activity for a person who is, who is a primary caregiver. So no doubt it can become very overwhelming if it is not done properly. Now, as we discussed that it is, it, it has a lot of natives, but it has also a lot of positives. So the caregivers, you know, go through a mixed bag of emotions, you know, as it is stressful, no doubt, it is also rewarding. Uh, people feel really good about that they are able to help their loved one who is unable to care for self. While it can be overwhelming and exhausting, it is comforting, you know, that you yourself are providing help uh, to the loved one who is unable to fend for himself or herself. While it is frustrating, on the other hand, it can be very satisfying also. So it is not all bad. You know, yes, there are stresses related to it. Yes, it is overwhelming, it is exhausting, but there are positive uh, emotions associated with that. And that is why I tell you that uh, people keep on doing, you know, because uh, there are positive emotions like rewarding, comforting and satisfying experience while providing care. So let's not talk about, although we are talking about that how to identify stress, how to deal with it, it's not all negative um, emotions about the caregiving. So please remember that. Now let's talk about that what, from the health standpoint, what caregivers risk when they are providing primary uh, caregiving service to their loved ones. So these are certain facts uh, repeatedly uh, reproduced in uh, various studies. And think of this number, 40, many, uh, half to two thirds of caregivers experience symptoms of depression. And more important is that approximately half of this number can develop major depressive disorder, you know, which is a serious psychiatric illness. Those people who have uh, depression symptoms, they also have anxiety disorders and substance abuse. One has to really uh, be on a lookout that if depression is taking hold. So this is the mental health risk uh, the, the caregivers take. On physical side of it, caregivers have multiple chronic conditions at increased rates, like heart disease, diabetes, almost twice the rate of non-caregivers. So physical health can get affected. And why we are talking about all these things, not to scare somebody and not do the caregiving activity because that number one is not the option. Number two, it is not good for your loved one. But 
can be, um, you know, we can deal with this. I mean, if we if we have a plan for caregiving, then these uh, increased risk can be minimized. That's why we are talking about. So don't think, that, oh my God, this doctor is telling us so many bad things about caregiving. Do I, should I even do it? No, no, no. That is not the point. Point is, yes, these are the risks. But if we do it correctly, then these risks can be minimized and your loved one will still have the benefit of you being uh, the caregiver. Now, chronic stress related to anything, including caregiving, can result in cognitive decline, like uh, concentration difficulties, memory problems, and whatnot. That risk is also there. So we saw that cognitive risk is there, uh, physical risk is there, uh, mental health risks are there. Uh, same way acid reflux disease, headaches, obesity, body pains. These are common in people who are providing caregiving activity. Again, stress-related symptoms. And this one last thing I will mention, then elderly uh, spouses who are taking care of their uh, partners or families, they have approximately 63% higher mortality uh, than non-caregivers of the same age, meaning... Um, Mortality means that, they, that the rate of dying is much higher compared to people who are not providing caregiving activity. So health risks are, risks are a plenty, but that doesn't mean that they cannot be dealt with. If properly done, caregiving can be a pleasant experience, which is beneficial to both uh, the person being cared for and person be, be, uh, providing the caregiving. And that is the whole purpose of doing this talk today. Now, if you are providing care to uh, a family member or friend, you should somehow um, make it a point that I will monitor myself, see whether I am under stress. And there are certain signs of uh, stress which I have listed here. So let's uh, ponder over one or two, three of them. If uh, Yeah, uh, we still have time. So suppose you are having feelings of anger. And if I just put the question there. If he asks me this one more time, I will scream if that is the feeling. Say like depression, I really don't care anymore. Exhaustion, I'm too tired for this. Um, health problems, I can't remember the last time I felt good. Sleeplessness, what if she wanders out of, uh, of, of, of the house or whatever? You know, so these, if we are having these thoughts, Consistently while providing caregiving. That means that you are feeling the stress of caregiving. And this is the time that we should start looking at that what can be done uh, to better manage the caregiving role. Please uh, keep the, the purpose of this slide was that monitor yourself, that what kind of thoughts you are getting related to caregiving activities, and that can give you a clue that. Um, you are under stress and let's address it. That is what the cause of this slide is. Now, what are the reasons for burnout and why people who are providing care for others, they don't take as good care of themselves? Let's talk about what are the reasons of burnout. You know, burnout meaning that person feels spent and exhausted and unable to, uh, to handle the situation any longer. That is what, and does not enjoy the job or activity he's in, he or she is involved in. What are the reasons for burnout? First one I'll say is denial of illness, and I will go in a little detail about this. Denial is that sometimes, you know, caregivers um, do not accept that what the care, care person is suffering from, what is the prognosis. And they just continue to do things uh, in the hope as if things are going to improve from here on while the doctor may be saying differently or the course of the illness uh, is entirely different. So we have to be fully aware of that what is uh, the illness, what course it is taking, and the symptoms person is showing, are they part of the, the illness itself rather than blaming yourself that as if you did or did not do something and that is why the person is not getting better. So having a very uh, accurate 
uh, perception of what the illness course is uh, will be will avoid burnout. Same way, uh, if you have unrealistic expectation about the responsibilities, your responsibilities, then you will definitely go to face the burnout uh, because these are unrealistic. What you cannot do, if you continue doing, then obviously it will result in mental exhaustion and burnout. If you don't have an adequate support system around you, obviously that, that is a reason why person people feel burned out. And if you don't attend to your care, that is another reason. People who are do, providing caregiving activity are successful, you know, if they keep time for themselves uh, and the balance um, between, between the caregiving activity, their work life, as well as their personal life. So these are the reasons for burnout and why people actually um, do not care for themselves is basically number one. And this is very common that they feel guilty about using time for themselves. This is the problem. That it seems to them that if um, they take some time off themselves, as if they are not doing service to the care person, the care person cared for. So un unrealistic guilt results in your own self-care suffering. You know? same, is, uh, same happens with some caregivers if they are ashamed of asking for help. Uh, you, you cannot do it alone. You have to ask other people. And if you are ashamed of asking, you will take more and more on yourself. And that will result in um, um, poor self-care for yourself. Now, Many, now, this is at this point, I really want to put it, and, and I, I think that some of you may even have noted if you are in caregiving role, that caregiver who is doing it out of goodness of his heart or his or her heart or love for the loved one and all that, some people, meaning your family or your friends, you take, man, manipulate you and take advantage of you. And this sometimes even involves the person who is being cared for. The person who is being cared for becomes a manipulator and tries to extract more and more out of. So one should be really aware of it because that can result in you losing uh, control of your own health. So uh, as you see, then these are the reasons why you may have very poor self-care of yourself and then leading to burnout at some point. And we'll talk in the next one or two slides, uh, one or two slides later, how your poor health can affect your loved one also. So this is just a quiz I put there, or you don't have to take notes or anything about this, but I think it came from uh, AARP. Uh, I, I thought this will, this will be useful to uh, put in front of you. Now, this is a quiz which you can do uh, really, really very easily. And this will tell you whether you are living with with, with burnout or not. So it's just a scale which asks certain questions and I will just go over one or two later on. And you rate your own feelings from one to seven on a scale of one to seven. And the question is simple, simple. In caring for a loved one, how often do you have the following experience? One is never and seven is always. And you, you find where you fall. And see, the questions are, which, which are indicative of caregiving stress or burnout and whatnot, if you feel resentful, if you feel trapped, you feel tired, not getting enough sleep, and so on and so forth. If you feel physically exhausted, have you been feeling disillusioned, feeling useless? So these are the questions. What do you do? You get this quiz, you rate your feelings and emotions right now, how you are doing. And then you can score yourself and see if you are doing, if you have score of less than 60, then you're doing fine. But suppose you are scoring more than 90 on this, then you are living with burnout and that is not a healthy situation. So there are certain simple tools available where you can actually assess yourself that on the spectrum of being providing healthy caregiving versus living with stress and burnout, you can actually uh, rate yourself and then accordingly you can um, arrange the help, arrange help or maybe modify your routine somewhere. 
Now this one, and again, I talk about this in my uh, uh, lectures to students and residents a lot. Why is care, caring for the caregiver important? So I will tell you, and it's very simple statement written there. Uh, if you do not take care of yourself and stay well, you will not be able to help uh, anybody else. And I will tell you some scientific data, uh, not data, but studies behind uh, this statement. The fact is this, that the institutionalization of the cared person is directly dependent on the health of the caregiver. This is how it happens. As long as the caregiver is healthy, the cared person stays home. But as soon as the, care, the caregiver becomes sick or ill, the cared person gets institutionalized. Okay, so this is fact number one. Fact number two is this. That institutionalization, institutionalization meaning uh, that when you go into long-term nursing home or assisted livings and whatnot, institutionalization has two very clear complications. One is that you have increased medical problems after institutionalization compared to if you had stayed at home, right? That is one. Number two, there is another fact that death occurs earlier in institutionalized person compared to if the person had remained at home. So when the person gets institutionalized, meaning goes to nursing home, uh, like facility, what happens is that number one, his lifespan gets shortened. These are average. I'm not saying that everybody who goes to nursing home has shortened lifespan, but on an average, the quality of life of a person in the institution is poorer and the lifespan is shorter. So if we put two and two together, this is what happens. The caregiver becomes sick or ill, leads to institutionalization of the cared person, leads to increased medical problems of the institutionalized person, and leads to early death of the person. So on an average, you I will say reverse of this now. On an average, if we can keep caregivers healthy, then chances are that we will avoid institutionalization. Chances are that we will avoid medical complications in the cared person who is disabled. And he will have longer life with better quality of life uh, at home. At some point, the person will have to go to uh, institutional setting, no doubt about it. But keeping the caregiver is so healthy. Uh, healthy is so important because it directly affects the quality of life of person uh, being cared for and the lifespan of the person. Now let's talk uh, quickly about, we have about 10 minutes and we will be able to finish in uh, time. How to... Um, how to cope with stress and how to avoid burnout. So basically, if all these things are listed here. I will see whether we can cover, how many we can cover. First of all, if you are a primary caregiver for somebody, then what you do is that you try to include other people. Never feel ashamed in asking other people to help you. Uh, and consider caregiving a activity and bring as many people as you can on, on, uh, on board, you know. Second thing is that you define the need uh, by listing caregiving tasks in group tasks. So what happens is that you can say, that these, these are the things with you. I think it is a good exercise if you do. That make list of what you do for the cared for person, you know, your dependent. Meaning you may be helping with personal day-to-day um, -day care. You may be helping with um, household chores. You may be helping with finances. Uh, make a list and group them that this, these are the activities falling in the financial management, this may be in the household. Once you do it, you are fully aware of you. You can have a visual of what you do for the person. And perhaps if you have other people involved in it, you may ask them that which one will be better, you know, who, who can do what tasks better and assign them. Now, never, <laughs> never forget to ask twice, tries as many times, you know, don't be ashamed because you may not get help in the first tasking. So please, please do that. You know, never feel ashamed about it. Um, also, you many people may not be available all the time, but somebody may say that, okay, I will take mom 
uh, to doctor's office on these dates. Um, and that please take that even that help and make a calendar, put it there, so at least that part is covered. Um, delegating responsibilities and uh, just helping coordinate care rather than everything being done by you. That will be very helpful. Um, and the last point, which we have stressed a little bit earlier, is uh, caring for yourself should be a priority. It should not be an afterthought, you know. So do things like take time for walks, physical activities, and hobbies, you know, that will uh, lead to longer uh, periods you can continue providing the care to the loved one and keep remain healthy. Now, how, what are the tips? How can you keep your physical ment and mental health um, steady during the course of your caregiving responsibilities? At boundaries, what you can do, what you cannot do, same goes with limit setting. Uh, these limits, whatever boundaries or limits you set should be realistic. It should not be something uh, like in the sky kind of uh, goals you should put in front of you. Um, he can accept help. We talked about delegating responsibility. Celebrate success. This is what I will say that uh, caregiving is a very tedious job, and you know it is very difficult uh, to to define what the success is. But even the simplest thing uh, that okay, you were able to take the loved one to the doctor's office, brought him back without having any incident. That itself is a success. You know, celebrate these uh, small occasions and times. Uh, which happened only because you were there. You know, so don't don't hesitate in taking credit for those and enjoying those moments. Taking breaks is very important. This is a, the next point is also important, and one should. What I would suggest to do is in your local area find out that what are the available daycare respite program, what are the home care services the loved one will qualify for, and arrange for those because that can be part of your support network, you know. So um, you can actually, there are certain places you can have caregiving training courses and there are many other so resources, which are some of which we have listed in the end. So never fail to utilize those external resources as well. Now, watch for signs of anxiety, uh, depression and seek professional help. You know, that is, um, the first two points written there. And some, let me, me being psychiatrist, let me just uh, talk about uh, what are the signs of depression. So depression symptoms are that first of all, feeling of sadness, not even inability to enjoy anything, not sleeping, not eating, uh, don't want to uh, meet other people, you know, feeling hopeless, feeling worthless. These are signs and symptoms of depression, sometimes even suicidal ideation. So always be aware of that. These are the signs of depression, and if they're there, seek professional help. What are the symptoms of anxiety? Basically feeling uh, keyed up all the time. You know, everything is bothersome, having uh, sleep, uh, sleep disturbance, feeling jittery, you know, feeling muscle tension and tension, muscle tension-related pain, which generally happen at the back of the head and shoulders and all that. So if these kind of symptoms are there, then seek professional help. Uh, this point I will really want to emphasize. What happens is that when you are in caregiving role, you're having all sorts of symptoms and you start treating yourself um, rather than going for professional help. And you start using prescribed and non-prescribed substances. Now, if it is done, Correctly, then there's no problem. But what I'm suggesting is monitor your intake of prescribed and non-prescribed over-the-counter um, substances or even um, alcohol use and whatnot and see whether it is going up because that is not a, not a good sign. Um, because say excessive use, suppose you're on pain medication and you're using more, suppose you're on anxiety medicine and you are using more than prescribed. Same way, if you are taking too much of over-the-counter sleep medications and whatnot, um, that is that needs to be monitored. That That is a sign that something is not right there. Now, uh, treatment recommendations from your doctor for any medical condition you have. Um, 
is obviously um, one more area that always go by what the doctor has suggested about the treatment of medical problem rather than taking things in your hand. And this part we already talked in detail, you know, that taking care of yourself uh, is so important that your loved one remaining at home is directly, um, uh, your health is directly responsible for keeping the uh, loved one at home. Otherwise, the person is likely to get institutionalized with uh, uh, alongside complications, you know, which we have with institutionalization. Now, sometimes what happens is that the caregiving, you are providing caregiving, but the person has mental health. Uh, it's not always for physical health uh, issues you provide. Uh, you become a primary caregiver. And when the care person has mental health issue, it comes with its own um, you know, set of kind of exclusive, so to say, problems uh, associated with mental health uh, issues. Uh, and obviously, you know, that uh, person with mental health or cognitive problem, I'm both talking about both, like people with dementia and people with mental illness, they have certain symptoms and behaviors which you would not see generally in a person who is physically disabled, uh, such as impulse control problems, such as uh, memory problems, related issues, uh, psychotic symptoms and related uh, paranoid disbelief and all those behaviors, accusatory behaviors. So mental health issues bring their own set of problems. So if you are providing care for a loved one who has mental health or cognitive issues such as Alzheimer's disease, dementia, then certain you have to go one more step ahead in caregiving to keep everything under control. First of all, you will have to be extra patient. You already, when you're providing caregiving to anybody, you have to be patient and you are. But with mental health caregiving, you have to be extra, extra patient and remain calm, you know. Uh, what happens is that dependent may not be able to tell you, but the dependents are likely uh, getting treated very easily and that is what they take on you because you are the loved one and they probably can act out in front of you why they do it whatever they do so understanding this will give you some uh, context for that how the person is behaving and remaining calm same way try not to take things personally because i think it is because of what they're doing is because of mental illness or perhaps a memory uh, issues rather than thinking you as a bad person or evil person. So don't take them, uh, they, their realizations personally. You know? um, <clears throat> one more thing, if we, if we can understand that the people with uh, mental illness, I mean, I'm talking about advanced mental illness or intellectual disability or dementia, sometimes they are unable to express their gratitude and what you're doing for them. Uh, so and, and this is a fact that if a person gives you a thank you or says, expresses his gratitude in return, that becomes, um, you know, much easier for to continue caregiving. But when you have to keep on doing things for which there's no gratitude, uh, never you get a uh, word of thanks, then it becomes difficult. But Understanding this fact that they may want to say this thing, but they don't have capability of, or it is very difficult to express them, may give you some solace that, uh, yes, probably he or she wants to, but is unable to express his or her gratitude. So that, that can help the situation. And with mental health issues and uh, cognitive issues like dementia, there's really no point in getting angry with, uh, with loved one because... Generally speaking, those behaviors uh, would not happen um, if they could have controlled it. So make, getting angry is simply going to make matters worse rather than improving anything. So all these things are very easy for me to say, I know when you are in day-to-day -day situations, it is very difficult, but practicing it does in the hand uh, gives you some uh, some control of the situation. 
Now, caregivers are real, true healthcare heroes. In in fact, you know they they provide, as you saw, thirty seven billion hours of caregiving is provided by for all, all the people, you know, for their families and friends. Um, all all of that is unpaid. So they are the true healthcare heroes. And one last thing I will say is this: that no one can do it alone. Uh, as I said in the beginning of this talk that if you have a plan and if you coordinate with others who are willing to help, then it can be done. It is, it, it, meaning it is a responsibility which you can fulfill without causing damage to you if we plan well. And that's about, thank, uh, about it. Thank you for participating in this uh, talk. And Gina, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mishra. It's such a wonderful presentation and so informative. Um, at this time, we're going to answer a few questions that have been submitted. The first one is, I am the primary caregiver for my mom and it can be exhausting. Sometimes I feel depressed. What can you recommend to try to not be feeling that way? Uh, very good. So uh, as I said, that uh, during the talk also, I said that it's very common that people who are providing caregiving uh, they feel depressed and also anxious. And approximately half of them can even go on to develop major depression, um, which can be very disabling. So as I said in the talk itself, that monitor the symptoms which we talked about. And if you have really uh, developed uh, depressive symptoms or, uh, or, or anxiety symptoms, my suggestion would be that talk to at least your primary care provider, if not, uh, mental health specialist. So seek professional help. That will be the first thing. But certain things you can do for yourself, uh, which, which I'm going to just give a few ideas, which probably you already know, but it doesn't hurt to go over them. Again, finding time for yourself is the best thing you can do because daily drudgery can get onto your nerves and cause depression and anxiety. Um, Make it a point. My suggestion would be make it a point that you will do at least one pleasurable activity per day to start with. You know that I'm providing caregiving, I'm doing two jobs, but this 15 minutes or half an hour, this I will keep for myself to do what I really like to do. I think that will be a good thing, good habit to assume. Um, it does not take too much time out of your caregiving or anything, but gives you a break from daily routine. There are certain things which have proven benefit on depression, regardless of its origin, whether it is because of caregiving, other stressor, or without any stressor. Number one, exercise. It is proven that exercise is almost as good as an antidepressant in its antidepressant effect. So that routine exercise, yoga, meditation, these are known um, ways to handle depression and anxiety. So bring about these uh, activities into your daily routine. But if symptoms are there, I would recommend that at least get evaluated um, whether some uh, expert help is needed and treatment is needed. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question is, I feel resentment that caring for my dad takes me away from my family and time for myself. I feel guilty about time away from my husband and kids, but also feel guilty if I'm not there for my dad. Any tips for not feeling resentment? This is such, this is such a, uh, an important question because these are the common feelings. And remember, we talked about that uh, caregiving is a, is a mixed bag of emotion. So on the one hand, caregiver feels resentment that uh, providing care, taking away so much of time from own life as well as uh, their own uh, families, nuclear family's life as well. You know, that, that a daughter who is kind of sandwich generation we talk about, that taking care of elderly father or mother, while has also young children at home. So resentment happens, you know, that, that uh, it's taking too much time away or dad's care is taking too much time away from my own responsibility. So. It is a very common emotion to have. Second, on the other hand, same way, the person will feel that if they don't spend time with the dead or loved one, then they feel guilty about it. So uh, the person 
you know, flip-flops between which one. Uh, today, this is my emotion. Tomorrow is this. If you do this, it doesn't happen. So, we understand. And it is common also. I have to say this thing. It is common. Common. What we can do, not feel either resentment or uh, having a conflict between resentment and guilt. Basically, I would say, uh, again, you had to assume uh, the, the same, you had to bring into practice the same uh, techniques which I talked about. That make caregiving a group activity, if you can. Uh, doing it alone will probably take a lot of time from your uh, daily routine. So, if you take this advice and if you can solicit and you know, if you can make it happen, that many people um, get involved in caregiving, then hopefully uh, you will not have that resentment because some of the activities may be shared by other people. Second thing which I will say is uh, simple have, simply having the acknowledgement this can happen and give you some comfort. You know, you will understand your own feeling that, that I'm feeling resentful and you can even have this that, okay, I was in a uh, webinar and I was told that this is a normal, not normal, but it's a common thing to happen. And we may oscillate between one, uh, on one side, feeling of resentment, on the other side, uh, the feelings of uh, guilt. So simply acknowledging your, uh, your emotions can help understand them, you know. And last thing I will say that, I do, and it may be difficult, but again, if these feelings are going, that means you are under stress and you have to find a way to find a balance between your personal life as well as caregiving responsibility. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is, my best friend is providing care for her husband with declining health. How can I help her when she is struggling? Okay, so the friend is providing care and uh, struggling, so you want to see that how you can help. I will say this thing, the best way to help is that if you can participate and provide some uh, some uh, help to her in caregiving activity. I think that will be the best way to uh, help. But suppose that is not possible, then again, the, what, what you heard in the talk today, I think that um, encouraging your friend to have time for herself uh, giving knowledge about this will be uh, very important. Second thing, which I would say will be very helpful in this situation, um, I have seen that many people are not aware of that what is respite care, what is daycare, uh, and availability in their own area. So you can also help your friend by giving them, giving her this information that listen, uh, I have heard of a respite care program in which you can say, uh, leave your loved one, say maybe I'm just giving an example that your mother uh, for the weekend, uh, this is the nursing home which provides the, um, the, the respite care. And respite care meaning that the person can be in a safe, supervised setting while the caregivers are away uh, for whatever reason. So these are short-term arrangements, you know, and many nursing homes do it. You can, uh, you can say that, okay, you can leave your mother at a nursing home which provides the respite care for weekend, and you can go for say your own friend's wedding or whatever the circumstances. So that way they can utilize respite care. Daycare is another thing which uh, the programs which are run on a daily basis. So the loved one who is disabled can go to these programs depending upon the eligibility. And they're pretty, um, medical daycare programs are pretty uh, accepting of <clears throat> medical morbidity. So uh, that way, during daytime, you know, they can spend at the daycare, they're giving you some respite and relief. So uh, first of all, participating in the caregiving can help your friend who's struggling, uh, telling her or him or her about these are respite care and daycare uh, should be taken advantage of another I'll let home care help also that whether uh, whether the insurance, Medicare, Medicaid would cover for uh, the home care help. That, that can also be helpful. And just reminding the friend that, listen, you have to keep time for yourself if you really want to last long in this role. All these things should help uh, your struggling friend. 
Okay, great, thank you. And actually speaking of respite care, that was the next question. And a few of our attendees were nice enough to put some resources for us where they live in the chat. So we've, we've put some, there's Monmouth County Department on Aging um, and Jewish Family Services. So that's in the chat if anybody wants to take note of it, which I think is wonderful. So we appreciate those resources. Um, so speaking of respite care and adult care, looking into it for a day for myself, how do I talk to my mom about exploring this option? She can be difficult. <laughs> yep. That, 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 is, that is, again, it's real, you know, uh, because as soon as you tell the mom that you are talking about respite care, oh my God, all hell breaks loose. You know, you want to put me in the nursing home, this, that, and other. So it does happen. Again, as we already discussed in the previous question, that respite care, daycare are really very valuable options in the in 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 the context of caregiving. You know, nothing can beat them uh, because not only the person uh, cared for goes to a place where they're safe and supervised, but it gives the very welcome relief to caregiver, rejuvenates the caregiver, so that they can continue providing. Uh, care for the longer term. So, um, number one, so there should not be any doubt about this thing, that these are valuable options and somehow we have to make it part of the caregiving plan, no matter what. They have to be somehow um, should be made into, into the longer term plan. Now, how to make uh, mom understand about this? I think that um, talking to mother and explaining the real uh, nature of these uh, services. You know, what is respite care? In the short term, this, that, and another. Daycare is daytime. You go and meet with people, socialize this. Many ways to explain. Um, and tell, exactly, I would say that tell the long-term benefit. You know, that, listen, if this thing we do, then it is, uh, it is likely that you stay at home. I continue to remain involved with you. And... Uh, it's best outcome for all of us um, compared to what the consequences are or the alternate side. So hopefully that will that will uh, bring her or, or, or any care, care person um, to understand the situation and accept the options, which are, again, under no circumstances should be considered punitive. I had to say this. <laughs> but suppose your care... Uh, loved one <clears throat> who you are caring for is totally unwilling to understand, then I simply say that we had to set boundaries and that we had to say that this is what it is which we feel will be in the best interest of you as well as now I'm going to say us. And that is why I would say that involve the whole family in explaining this, which may improve the chances of acceptance. Sometimes as as Again, I will say this thing, although it is unpleasant to say, sometimes caregivers get manipulated by the care person also. We talk about it. It's nothing unknown. So we really need to see, and if it is really in the best interest of the care person and the whole um, court system around her or him, then it has to be uh, clearly explained, you know, that this is how we should be doing from here on. Thank you. It's necessary. Yep. It's, it's, it's necessary. Um, the last question is, I'm caring for a good friend with a chronic disease. Family has become more involved than they have been in the past. Often they are not helpful or cause more work for me. How should I deal with this? And you are not alone. Uh, I had to say this thing that in a survey uh, by Caregiving Network of America, 65% of the caregivers said that families and friends don't help, especially the families. They don't. <clears throat> so uh, this is a common situation. And what we can do, again, as we discussed before, I would suggest that have a conference with all people who are involved in this person who you uh, think are, can possibly be involved in, um, in, in caregiving activity. And depending on the circumstances, again, uh, this is what we already discussed, that List all the activities which require help. Uh, see who is in situation to do what, and then assign those roles. In the end, again, you know, people have to agree. I totally agree with this, that you cannot force somebody to do it. But 
unless you solicit or request, nobody is going to do it. So it is in your interest that make it even more, uh, you know, uh, activities um, tailor made for certain situations of people. Whatever you can do, if you make list and see the circumstance that this person can do this, this person can do other things, that will be the best uh, best idea. Um, having a conference with all of them, then um, repeatedly soliciting. Don't don't stop if somebody says no, uh, because put the latest situation in front of the family and say that now this has happened. Maybe your own situation has changed uh, or the loved one's situation has changed. So bring about again that this has happened. Now I, I was doing it, but I'm not able to do it any longer. And hopefully they will come around. Um, generally what happens is that many people don't seek help as much because they feel shame, number one. Number two, they don't, for some reason, some emotional reasons of their own, they have difficulty delegating the tasks to other people. They think that I should be doing everything myself to my to my mother or father. You know, that is also a problem. Not only that people, family members don't want to help, but this is also an issue that people don't want to delegate and whatnot. So, first of all, examine yourself. If you are taking too much on you or yourself, then try to delegate. Solace it again and again. Have to make a plan so that Whatever is convenient for other people, uh, assign those activities to them. And even if somebody can do a little bit, every little bit helps. So don't hesitate in accepting even a smaller, uh, uh, meaning smaller areas of help which are available. Accept them because every little bit helps. Okay, great. Thank you again, Dr. Mishra, for speaking with us today and answering all the questions. This was so helpful and informative, and we really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us on this really important topic. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who joined as well. Please watch your email for an evaluation of the program. We appreciate you taking the time to fill it out. We want to hear your feedback, and it also gives you an opportunity to let us know if there are other topics of interest for future programs. You'll also receive the link to the recording of this webinar, uh, as you may want to listen again or share it with others. Please visit hackensackmeridianhealth.org for a list of upcoming programs we have. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone, and stay safe. Thanks again for joining. Thanks again, Dr. Mishra. No problem. Thank you so much.